um, contributed significantly for developing several guide documents in IAEA on uh, nuclear security related uh, uh, topics. So in the morning session, I will hand it over to uh, Chris Price for uh, giving you some inputs on this area. And before that, I have two experts who arrived this morning. I want to introduce them. And we have Patrick Reiners from France, their legal expert. Uh, uh, he, he would be uh, um, guiding you on the project, group project number five. Those of you who selected uh, project five, uh, he is available here, and at the end of the day, you can start meeting him. We also have James Hilko from the US, another expert uh, for the group project number uh, six, uh, root cause analysis. He is also available. Today, you can start discussing on the project six. So with this, I will hand over to Chris to start his presentation. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, as you heard, I was a um, uh, regulator for many years in the UK. Um, I retired three years ago, and since then I've been working part-time for the IAEA. Um, and um, that's one of the reasons I'm here today. <clears throat> So I believe you had a lot on nuclear safety last week. Um, this morning, uh, we're going to discuss nuclear security. Um, what is it? Um, what are the objectives and the fundamental principles of nuclear security? Um, how does it uh, play into the infrastructure for a nuclear power program? Um, and then after the coffee break, uh, we're going to look at um, uh, recommendations for protection of nuclear facilities, uh, such as nuclear power plants. And um, finally, uh, if we've got time, um, I'll have a quick word about how the IAEA uh, can assist member states in this area. So what is it? Um, well, here's a definition which um, uh, we produced some years ago. Um, you'll also hear the term physical protection. Um, as the IEA started its um, uh, issuing recommendations on how to protect nuclear material way back in 1972. Um, this was due to concern that, that nuclear material, if it fell into the wrong hands, could possibly be used to make an improvised nuclear device, in other words, a sort of weapon of some kind, uh, and one can uh, comprehend what the consequences of that would be um, if terrorists got hold of um, uh, a, a nuclear weapon of some kind. Um, and the term physical protection was used rather than nuclear security, because as many of you all know, uh, in your own languages, uh, the words safety and security use the same word. And we needed something to distinguish between uh, what we call nuclear security from nuclear safety. Um, and so that term was used historically um, until uh, the IEA really started up having a large program following uh, the events of 9-11 in the US or the attacks on Washington and New York, uh, when <coughs> the whole subject uh, went off to the, up to the top of the political agenda, um, and the IEA started a program which encompassed not only nuclear material, but also radioactive material and what they call material out of regulatory control. In other words, material that's been lost or stolen. <coughs> so the big difference here, if you look at this definition, um, is that what we're concerned are, are intentional acts. And this is the big difference between security and safety. Uh, safety is concerned with accidents, natural hazards like earthquakes and things like that. Um, uh, equipment failures. Um, but what we're concerned about is individuals, uh, groups, who intentionally want to steal material, radioactive material, nuclear material, or uh, what we call sabotage um, 
facilities or, or nuclear material and transport to cause a radiological hazard. So, um, what could they do if they got hold of material? Um, well, as I mentioned, nuclear weapons, uh, or what we call imp improvised nuclear devices. Um, but also a radioactive material, of course, is the concern about uh, dirty bombs, which are radiological dispersi dispersal devices, or REDs, which are radiological exposure devices, whereby someone hides material in a public area where the people are going to be present um, for periods of time and they get irradiated without realizing it. And then, of course, um, sabotage. So, <coughs> um, if you probably heard, the nuclear program worldwide is pretty large, as these statistics show. Um, and in terms of ra radioactive material, uh, radioactive sources, um, there are absolutely millions of them around the world, and they, they're used in all sorts of uh, uh, medicine, agricultural, in industry, research, etc. And uh, some of these um, are pretty strong and therefore pose a serious hazard to health if they're misused. Um, so, establishing an effective, sustainable nuclear security infra infrastructure is important in every country in the world, because every country in the world, I think with that, with hardly an exception, at least has radioactive sources if it doesn't have uh, nuclear material. Um, I mentioned that the program really sort of took off in 2002, um, but it, it Concern had really started at some in the previous decade um, because in the early 1990s we started getting reports of nuclear material being offered for sale, which was a bit disturbing because um, uh, criminals should not really have got hold of this material um, and the fact that they were offering it to anyone who could uh, uh, come up with the money was uh, a matter of international concern. And in order to establish the size of the problem, uh, the agency set up um, what they call an incident and trafficking database, whereby member states reported confirmed cases, uh, because there was a lot of media speculation at the time as to how many, how much material was going on, and, and people wanted a clear, authoritative source of information on this problem. Um, and this has now been running um, for. Uh, 24 years now, and as you can see from this, we're talking about getting 100 confirmed incidents a year. We're well, probably more than that now because uh, initially there were very few being reported, although they may well have been happening. Um, so this confirms that um, <coughs> material, what we call out of regulatory control, um, is um, quite a serious problem worldwide. And the answer to that, of course, is to secure it at source to make sure that it doesn't go missing in the first place and uh, end up being trafficked around the world to potential uh, groups who would misuse it. Uh, there are statistics uh, of the types of material. Um, most of it's radioactive material rather than nuclear, um, but nevertheless, um, some of it is quite uh, strong material. So the IEA's vision um, is to assist member states to establish this effective security uh, wherever the material is being used, stored or transported. <coughs> so one of the things that um, uh, was necessary w was to established a nuclear security series of documents, rather like the safety standards, um, uh, in which um, authoritative advice could be given to member states as to what um, they should have in place and how they might implement nuclear security. And the very top tier document is, was um, 
issued about I th only about 2012, so it's not that many years ago. Um, but what it does is w we, we looked at all the international instruments. You're going to have a, dis a presentation tomorrow on, on that, so I'm not going to talk about international instruments today. Um, but looking at those, um, uh, they contain a number of obligations in there, and we distilled those together with um, <coughs> other, other things to come up with what we call 12 essential elements um, of a nuclear security regime. In other words, the sort of regime every country should have um, to some extent, uh, depending on whether it's got a nuclear program or whether it's just got uh, radioactive sources. Um, but the, 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 um, the content's the same, it's just the amount of uh, resources one would need to deploy uh, to effectively protect this. And against that is, is the objective uh, as well, um, which is to protect persons, property, society and the environment from the harm, harmful consequences of a nuclear security event. That objective is almost identical to safety, uh, with the exception there they're talking about the harm, harmful consequences of an accident or something like that, and we're talking about a nuclear security event, in other, uh, in other words, a deliberate, intentional uh, act to uh, cause harm or, or to steal material with the potential uh, of taking it to another place to cause um, harmful consequences to persons, property, society, and the environment. So I mentioned that uh, the IEA is encouraging everyone to have a nuclear security regime. What is it comprised of? Um, it's got three bits really to it. The <coughs> First one is a, what we call a legislative and regulatory framework. Um, so that's a framework set up by government with laws, regulations, um, other administrative intergovernmental things. Because unlike safety, <coughs> the government and its agencies are involved on a day-to-day -day basis with nuclear security. And it's not just an issue for the operator and the regulator. Um, because we're talking about potential criminal acts and um, preventing uh, criminal acts is a state responsibility as much as a responsibility of individual companies or people. Um, so um, government plays a large part in it with its various institutions and organizations who implement this framework. Um, uh, for instance, and border control, um, protecting major public events, uh, right down to often providing uh, the guard force or at least the response force to nuclear facilities or radioactive facilities uh, who will react in the case of any um, event being detected there which indicates uh, a criminal or un otherwise unauthorized act. Um, and finally, uh, the regime comprises the systems and measures that uh, uh, the holders of this material uh, have to put in place. So there are 12 essential elements, and we'll quickly go through them one by one. And the first one <coughs> was very much to make it clear that it's states who are responsible for this. They can't abrogate this, they can't delegate it and leave it to just some small little group in their country, they can't leave it to a neighboring country, um, um, uh, they can't say, well, it's the IEA's responsibility or the United Nations' responsibility, it is clearly their responsibility. Um, but the other thing is this is, this is a sensitive area, obviously, um, because it impinges on national security, it impinges upon the rights of, of states to run their own affairs without interference from other countries or other bodies. Um, and um, so states were also very keen to, to uh, put this, emphasize this state responsibility, in other words, it's my responsibility, not anyone else's, um, and I acknowledge that uh, because I don't want anyone else um, 
coming in and telling me what to do and how to run my own country. So, <coughs> having a country accepted that it's, it's their responsibility, they then need to work out who is actually going to be have responsibilities in this area. Um, and clearly, the operators or the carriers of material um, have a prime responsibility because it's in their control, uh, whether they own it or not. Um, but then there are all these other bodies who also um, are going to assist them, um, especially in the event of any criminal acts in, or in cases of any loss of material. Um, and these are many and varied, uh, as, as we'll see. Um, key competent authorities, well, you know, most countries have all of this, and to some extent or other, uh, these bodies get involved at some stage or other, um, whether they're enforcing the regulations, uh, whether they're protecting the border and looking for material being trafficked across it, um, the intelligence services, because here um, we've got a key thing of what is the threat? Um, <coughs> as you, if you're a, uh, a normal operator of a facility, it's not within your gift to know exactly what the threat is, who are the people out there, how many of them are there, what's their capability um, to attack me and things like that. That, again, is where a state comes in because it has bodies which collect information, intelligence on terrorist groups, criminal groups, etc., and who can distill all that information to, uh, into a form of a threat assessment so that the people holding nuclear material understand what they have to protect against. So, um, part of this also, obviously, is then to um, not only establish these laws and regulations, but have a body, um, we use the word competent authority here because there are a lot of different ones in security, but of course the key one is the regulatory body, regulatory authority, whatever name it goes with, and making sure that on behalf of the government that's going to exercise day-to-day -day oversight over those people who are authorised, legally empowered to hold nuclear material or radioactive material, uh, and make sure that they um, are protecting it in accordance with uh, the legal requirements. As there will be many of these, then they need to be coordinated one with another um, so that we don't have duplication of effort, um, that when the resources of another uh, government agency is required, uh, it can be quickly obtained. Um, And so we go on. Um, one interesting thing here is also um, on the accountancy side. Um, with radioactive sources, everyone should have a register and report their holdings of, of what they've got. Um, this is important because unless you know what you have and where it is, you couldn't start really protecting it properly. Um, but also, if it does get stolen, then um, you can identify that from your records that stuff has gone missing. <coughs> In the um, <coughs> nuclear material case, um, there is already a requirement to, uh, which you're going to hear about later on today, about nuclear material accountancy and control in order to report holdings of nuclear material to the IEA under safeguards agreements. Um, but that nuclear material accountancy is also very important for security because, again, that's the authoritative source of what material you have at a facility in order to know where it is and to uh, categorise it to determine what level of security it needs. Uh, but the control aspects are also very important because um, if you exercise good control over material, then it deters people stealing it, uh, or if they do try and steal it, it should be recognised very quickly that something's gone missing um, because of the various control mechanisms you've put in place. Um, 
And then, of course, there, there is the external thing like import-export controls on nuclear material, uh, enforced through border controls, um, and sanctions. In other words, um, it's no good saying in the law that people have got to do all these things and look after this material properly if there is not a sanction in the form of uh, prisonment or fines for people who fail to do this properly. Um, so sanctions are the ultimate, um, and we're talking about legal sanctions here, uh, following prosecution in a, in a court of law. Um, legal hierarchy, this is, uh, uh, I've been to a number of countries on advisory missions in this area, and every country is different when it comes to its, its legal hierarchy, and they have different names for things like laws and statutes and decrees and orders and regulations um, <clears throat> but essentially there's a, there is a hierarchy with a constitution at the top uh, laws which are passed by parliament regulations which may be made by various state bodies um, and uh, down below they might put voluntary guard guidance but i think that would include things like codes of conduct um, which um, are issued as good advice and if you don't take it then you've got to explain um, why something went wrong uh, if what you did was and failed to uh, comply with a code of practice so often the guidance is not quite as voluntary as it sounds um, international transport is a key area because um, this is when th something could go wrong um, and um, the material is going to move uh, from out of the t jurisdiction of one country into a jurisdiction of another, or perhaps even through another jurisdiction before it gets to the final one. So you can get a number of countries involved, and some of the transport can take place in international airspace or the high seas, where um, there is no single country responsible. Um, but in the case of movements of nuclear material, it's important that uh, the country responsible uh, is identified in advance um, and that it looks after the material until it's handed over to the recipient in due course. So there should be a seamless uh, procedure here to make sure that whenever material is moving internationally, uh, there is a responsible country for it every stage of the movement. Um, I mentioned briefly about penal or criminal legislation. Um, this is uh, of um, importance from the point of view of um, acting as a deterrent um, and persuading people um, that they really should do the right thing. And... Um, Ultimately, uh, even extraditing offenders, as you'll hear tomorrow when we get on to international instruments. International cooperation and assistance. Um, it's in every country's interest that nuclear and radioactive material is properly looked after and secured. Because if it's stolen in one place, it can end up in another country uh, very easily, as we've seen from the uh, uh, trafficking database. Um, where material is detected often at borders coming in from another country. Um, and so um, designating points of contact in each country so that uh, people know who to contact in the event of certain things is very important. Uh, sharing information about threats particularly and um, generally exchanging experience um, are, are all part, play an important part in this global nuclear security regime. Assessment of threats, I mentioned that briefly already. Um, you've got to know what the threats are in order to know what you've got to protect against. And what we're talking here primarily is the capability of the individual or groups who are known to pose a threat. Um, because that cap knowing that capability, you can then work out exactly how much protection you need to put on certainly high consequence targets like 
nuclear power stations, which, if sabotaged, um, could cause the sort of results that you've seen, or we've already seen in places like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Um, having identified the threat, then we want to identify what are the targets needing protecting. Um, a nuclear facility can be quite a large place, and it'll include perhaps even sort of canteens and administrative buildings and things like that. Well, they're not really the key things. What you're really protecting um, are the material, um, or in the case of sabotage systems, which if you lost them, safety systems like primary cooling circuits, would result in a significant radiological hazard arising. So identifying all these targets is important. And then we use a risk-informed approach. And that this is really the kernel of nuclear security. This is all about risk management in, in terms of an external threat, um, or even an internal one, but intentional acts by, by groups, whether they're, they, they're going to come a, uh, from outside, or whether even they may already be employed or have look, uh, legitimate access to the um, facilities themselves. Uh, because in security terms, risk has three functions. One is the threat. The second are the consequences of that threat, if it's applied to particular targets. Um, and the third is vulnerability. So in other words, we're looking at protecting things from the threat, which could cause unacceptable consequences, uh, I mean, and in consequence terms, there is a grading because some consequences might not be very serious. Others could be you know, potentially affecting um, neighboring states. Um, and, um, and then putting in the amount of protection uh, to uh, prevent um, or minimize the risk of a threat being successful and causing these consequences. So this is what it's all about, risk, vulnerability, and potential consequences, and balancing those three. Um, because threat is not static. Potential consequences can vary considerably, depending on what the target is. Um, stealing a, a radioactive source from a hospital, which is used to uh, in, be injected into people for doing tracing, uh, is not actually going to be very serious because you've probably got a low ra radioactivity, a very short half-life, um, and uh, that's not really serious. Ste stealing something like cobalt-60 with very high radioactive material, long-lived, um, totally different question. And so you have to balance uh, the amount of effort you put into uh, ensuring the most dangerous things are protected um, the most. And having put in all these procedures, then you obviously need to detect events, whether they're actually at a facility or at a major public event or at borders or wherever. Um, uh, attacks could take place or material could be smuggled um, uh, through. Um, having done all this uh, and put in uh, lots of nice security, um, just the same as safety, one doesn't then say, well, we're sure now nothing is ever going to happen. Uh, we've got a good thing here to defeat um, uh, whatever is thrown at us, and um, that's it, job done. Well, it's not, because um, we always have to repair that they are successful. Um, uh, hopefully they'll be defeated, you know, um, but one can't never guarantee that. And therefore, we need to have what we call contingency plans in the case that there is an attempted theft or attack to sabotage a facility um, and uh, it being successful and, and the follow-up actions that will be then required. Um, 
and these are quite complex plans. Uh, you've probably heard about emergency plans for safety, the same here. We've got to mesh those in. They get multi-agency response will be involved and we need to make sure the plans are there and practiced regularly so that if ever there is a call upon them, everybody knows exactly what their role is and what they have to do. And having put together this very complex regime involving many agencies, involving the operators holding material, the carriers who transport it, um, uh, the regulatory bodies who make sure that uh, the, the, the regulations are complied with, etc. Uh, we then need to sustain this because having set it all up um, at some expense, the probability is that absolutely nothing will happen. Um, if you ask me about how many you know, successful attacks have there been uh, against nuclear facilities worldwide in the 30, last 30 years, I'd probably say hardly any. Um, so you've got this problem of, of the consequences of something going wrong could be very, very serious. On the other hand, the, the probability of this happening in form of attack is certainly in past experience pretty low. Um, so you've got to motivate all these people who've got all these responsibilities to carry on doing them. Um, when everything appears to be nice and happy out there and there are no bad people in the world and we can all get on producing our electricity or whatever else from our nuclear power plant. Um, so sustainability is absolutely key. It is, uh, and, and one of the basis is something we'll talk about, nuclear security culture, or like, similar like safety culture. Um, and keeping the threat up to date, etc. So that any changes are identified, um, uh, and this all really comes down to leadership from the top, and having integrated management systems so that uh, security is integrated into the overall management of a facility, um, and. Uh, Management includes quality management as well, and that's applied as much to uh, security equipment um, as it is to any other um, functions uh, of the facility. So that's um, a quick run through of what nuclear security should look like in a state. Um, and we'll look at, uh, go into a bit more detail in subsequent uh, lectures about how one would set this up in the case of uh, embarking on a nuclear power program uh, and actually protecting a nuclear facility. Um, but at this stage, uh, are there any questions um, from any of you about what we've covered so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, no, as I said, the, uh, this is one thing the operator can't do. He doesn't have access to uh, intelligence uh, records and police criminal uh, records and things like that. Um, no, this has to be decided by the state.
sorry about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so here there really is a real threat day by day. Um, and um, I think the world um, really woke up to that in the nuclear area following the, uh, the Stutznet's um, uh, attack. Um, and uh, everyone suddenly realized that actually it was not only protecting information on computer systems that was important. I think everyone had really realized this for a long time. They might not have been doing it very well, but they, uh, everyone you know, these days has their own personal computer and recognizes that uh, they need to protect information on it um, uh, in order not to um, assist people trying to scam them, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, the big real difference is that um, during the last sort of 10, 20 years, computers are being used increasingly in the form of uh, instrument and control systems at nuclear facilities. Uh, now, this is not information. This is just data coding. Um, and uh, these have been put in, um, in some cases, with remote diagnostic availability and stuff like this, uh, thinking that no one would you know, meddle with these, surely. Um, but of course, these are equally vulnerable uh, to attack. Uh, if not connected to the internet, they nevertheless can be uh, attacked by uh, someone uh, getting to physically in contact with a computer terminal and uh, attaching a USB stick or something to it and downloading viruses. So uh, this is probably the, the big area that we've seen a change is, is protecting uh, process control systems, um, which by themselves might not uh, lead to radiological consequences, but certainly they would lower the amount of defense in depth if you start losing safety control systems um, at the same time that you launch a physical attack on, a, on a, another system uh, in the uh, facility and, and uh, end up with no, no safety uh, control and uh, Reactors running away out of control. Okay, any further questions? Yeah, one more. Sorry, just a quick question. You just mentioned Stux, uh, Stuxnet. Yes. I believe it was an attack for supposedly or allegedly from Israel to Iran, correct? Yes. So should we, should we be worried about uh, security coming from a security threat coming from a non state actor, or should we, should we be worried about <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, it, it's one often I get asked by um, the Republic of Korea <laughs> in similar, similar form. Um, no, what we're talking about security is against uh, what we call non-state actors. In other words, um, uh, terrorist groups, uh, individuals, etc. Um, we're not talking about state-level attacks whether these are in the form of an invasion of your country by a neighboring one um, or, or um, um, uh, of that kind. Um, I think with computer security threats, the issue here is that when you get an attack, um, and they're pretty frequent, it's not easy to identify um, where they originate anyway. Uh, who, is who is originating this attack? Um, is it a is it a state-led thing, um, or, or is it just a, 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 a young teenager sitting in his home, uh, playing with a computer and um, seeing if he can, you know, uh, hack his way into your computer network? Uh, you don't really know, um, and I don't think, in practical terms, it makes an enormous difference. Um, again, if you've got some very important computer system, then you're going to apply. <laughs> You know the most uh, effective ways of protecting you can, um, rather than looking and going, deciding whether you know the attack is a state level one or not. Um, I think I'm going to cut it there because well, I need to move on if we're going to have our coffee break on time by uh, getting through the next um, presentation. A, qu a quick one here. As you can see, there is a, there is a lot of uh, organization. 
embedded in the uh, security system. But UAG is possibly to integrate all this organization with uh, through the uh, nuclear power program. In case you want to to Alan. Who is the response organization? <coughs> Um, well, you'll always need an external response organization because if you get it a criminal attack on a facility, this is then immediately becomes a case of law and order and is a matter for the local police. Um, and so the police will always come and look, uh, respond or should do to any serious crime. Um, but um, often countries want um, a, a response organization uh, to defeat the people as well as investigate, capture them, uh, in prison, put them in prison, uh, charge them with various criminal offenses. So um, the response organization comes from whoever the government determines that should be. Um, in some cases, like the UK has a specialized police force. Other countries, I know, um, because the place was located on the border, um, it gave the job to the, the border guards um, uh, to protect the facility as well. In, in other cases, um, they can be the army or, or whoever. Um, it's, it's just up to the country to work out um, what it needs. Um, but if it's once a dedicated response force at a facility, then that's going to be a fairly specialised body, and even if it's part of a, a wider thing, then um, uh, part of the National Guard, for instance, or something like that, um, then uh, you'll need a, a specialised body within that bigger overall organisation who are familiar with what needs to be protected in nuclear terms. OK, so can we now get on with the next one? So, um, this being a nuclear energy course, um, I'm sure you've all heard by now often about the milestones um, document uh, that they produced, um, I think, um, at least 10 years, 12 years ago, this came out, uh, being started uh, to provide guidance on how to prepare to implement a power program. And although this milestones document does mention security, um, of course, it's covering the, the, all the preparations in a much broader way. And uh, what it contains on security is a prompt, but uh, uh, we decided that actually some more detailed guidance was really needed um, in exactly what one would do uh, before reaching the three milestones um, of a nuclear power program development. And so we produced this book on um, establishing a nuclear security infrastructure um, for a nuclear power program. And we broke it down into a number of basic elements which I'm going to cover uh, one at a time. Um, And we're talking about here a nuclear security infrastructure. So we're talking about policy. How's the government going to decide who does what? Legislation. Um, what legislation is needed by the government to ensure that uh, everything is done correctly? The various organisation things that are needed, um, like coordination, uh, assignment of responsibilities, etc. Um, before one gets to the various nuclear security systems and measures that have got to be put in place <coughs> at three levels here. Um, prevention, which is really what we're focusing a lot on here today, um, which has become known as the first line of defence, um, because our aim should be to prevent attacks or prevent material being stolen. Um, but because of contingency plans, we need a second line of defense if um, these fail. And um, so we need to detect if stuff has been stolen or detect if um, 
a sabotage attack is underway uh, in order to get an appropriate response by whoever um, has been uh, allocated that responsibility. Um, so, the first thing, and the thing that has to be done by milestone one, is work out a national policy and strategy for nuclear security. Um, because um, if you're going to make a decision to embark on a power program, you need to know what you need to have in place um, for that, um, and how it meshes in with the existing nuclear national security uh, infrastructure. Um, and so this all needs working out. It's really the what's and if's. Um, you need to undertake the threat assessment, for instance, assess and identify what's required. Um, and so this really is a key preparatory scoping exercise carried out by government prior to milestone one. One of the things that will come out, of course, is you will need some new laws or amended laws um, in order to deliver uh, what you want and to deter uh, things involving nuclear uh, facilities or nuclear material. Um, so you've got to identify the instruments here, uh, the competent authorities, the expertise required. Uh, that's all a phase one thing. Um, by phase two, you need to have put in place all this legislation because uh, from the start of phase three, you're actually starting to construct a nuclear facility. So everything legal needs to be in place before that stage, in other words, at milestone two, so that you're all ready to go ahead with construction. And um, Thirdly, you need a regulatory framework, and here we're talking about setting up a regulator who's going to assess applications, um, the safety and security certainly of, of a proposed plant uh, to ensure that it's going to be adequate. Um, important thing here is uh, that things are secured by design. So this means the the setting up a, a regulatory body, putting in place a regulatory body program which includes authorizations or approvals for work to be carried out, inspection to ensure it's carried out properly and enforcement if the uh, licensee concerned um, has failed to comply with some legal requirement. Um, and this all these processes and procedures need to be in place by phase two because you're going to be regulating the thing from the time it starts construction uh, in order to sure ensure that it is constructed safely and it is secured by design uh, and you're not going to bolt on security uh, later on. Uh, as a, a sort of last resort when it becomes much more difficult and much more expensive. Threat assessment. Um, well, I mentioned you need to think about um, who is actually going to do this. We had the question already, who's responsible here? Well, that's, got a, that's a phase one thing. Who, who is going to, you know, do the threat assessment and work up a thing which we call a design basis threat which is often more commonly the responsibility of the competent authority regulatory body uh, but it's a more sophisticated um, assessment really than the national threat assessment. The national threat assessment is based on what is known at the moment. Uh, the design basis threat is tending to look ahead a bit at well, how could this change in the, in the medium term? And if there's any gaps, let's fill them in with some sensible um, uh, sort of things like, you know, how much explosives are the people likely to bring into the plant to attack it? I mean, it's very key from a design because you can protect against explosive attacks if you know 
A, what sort of explosive it is, and B, how much there is of it. Uh, and that will depend then on, on how actually uh, you put concrete to make sure that uh, the explosion is going to have no effect. Um, so, um, by phase two, certainly one needs to have um, both of these in place because... The operator um, in phase three constructing this plant needs to build in security to counter the threat or the threat capabilities which are assessed as possible um, uh, a potential um, to an attack on the facility. Management systems. I mentioned integrated management systems already. Uh, these are absolutely key. Um, and this is not only going to have to cover uh, some of the things we will already mentioned, but of course we need to protect um, sensitive information. Um, this is very important. Uh, there will be a security plan for the facility uh, which will define exactly what's in place. You do not want a potential attacker getting hold of that information because then he knows exactly what he's got to circumvent to achieve is objective of theft or sabotage. So that sort of information needs protecting and you need um, systems in place to do that. Um, trustworthiness of people. Um, I think most of us now accept that uh, although we'd like to trust all our fellow citizens, um, some of them might be uh, turn out to be bad eggs and we therefore need to have a system in place to make sure that you don't recruit known criminals and people like that uh, and and stop them getting uh, authorized access to the facility so a trustworthiness program that all needs to be set up um, again by the end by phase two uh, the milestone two i mean um, because it's going to have to be applied from construction onwards um, HR needs um, or other ones, uh, what training is going to need, who's going to need training, what, what sort of training they're going to require. This is all stuff you need to work out by milestone two um, because you're going to have to apply all this um, management system and nuclear security culture and sustainability all through all throughout phase three. Um, and so this is all mostly has to be done in milestone two. Um, <clears throat> then the various measures, of course, to um, secure uh, the facility. Um, I mean, these include um, the regulator uh, coming up what we call a graded approach. Um, so uh, you can identify um, what uh, how much security needs to be applied to various targets. Um, what needs to be applied at the construction site? Uh, I would suggest that once you start constructing a nuclear power plant, this is a multi-billion pound project, you're going to want to protect that construction site to some extent from the word go. Um, and then as more and more stuff, um, so even before the nuclear material arrives, you're going to um, need to make sure the thing is being put up and no one's hidden a bomb in the middle of it, uh, it um, which could go off later on when the material's there. So there are all these sort of measures to um, take in place. Similarly for radioactive material, um, here's a, a um, one of the things a nuclear power plant will produce is a lot of radioactive waste um, and so uh, Whereas you might just have a program at the moment for radioactive sources, you're going to have to widen that in scope to cover all radioactive material, which could pose a, a hazard if um, um, dispersed or, or used as an exposure device. Um, if you've got nuclear material into the country, then of course one of the things you have to plan for is you actually might lose some of that. Um, and uh, so this is again is a, ch um, a need to make sure that your program for material out of regulatory control um, 
uh, includes measures to uh, respond to criminal or other acts involving uh, not only radioactive material being out of uh, control, but also nuclear material out of control. And here there are three areas, deterrence, sorry, pre prevention, which that includes deterring, making the target look too hard to attack, uh, securing information about it so that uh, uh, people wanting to attack uh, do not know exactly what um, protection means there and trustworthiness making sure that um, potential criminals etc are not granted legal access to the facility. Uh, detection um, for material out of control is obviously all this border monitoring and stuff like that, um, or other detection at other places. And then, of course, the response is quite complicated because you've got not only to assess what happens when uh, alarms go off, but um, you could then have a crime scene and you need managing. There are forensics which can be used to identify where material might have come from. You've got to recover the material and return it. Um, um, and so there's a lot to do in that area. International cooperation, um, certainly this area, um, you need to make sure you've got your points of contact nominated, uh, that the international community has been told about them, uh, how to get hold of them. Um, and so this is a thing which goes on throughout all the phases of embarking on a nuclear power program so that is um, very quickly a run through um, what am I doing on time 10 20 good we've got plenty of time for some more questions so that's that really is um, a very quick gallop through what's in this book um, so anyone engaged in embarking on a nuclear power program and planning and the management of it. This is the key document to look at to work out when things need to be do done. But basically they all fall into sort of three three things. In, in f Before milestone one you need to consider, assess, recognize, identify um, in order to develop the policy and the strategy. So in other words, it's doing a scoping exercise here in some depth so you know exactly what's going to be required. Phase two then is to deliver most of that. Uh, you need to enact laws and regulations, uh, develop, establish, define uh, regulatory programs, policies, procedures, requirements, so that once uh, but that's by milestone two because then on mar for milestone three um, once you've tendered and got an accepted a tender then construction could start and all these things then need to be in place uh, to secure the construction site um, and be prepared to receive uh, material in due course and that's not only nuclear material but Every single nuclear power plant I've ever been also has radioactive sources in it for one reason or another. So it's not just nuclear material we're going to see inside a nuclear power plant. So, um, so during phase three, this is when you will implement, review, update, sustain responsibilities, requirements, systems and measures. Um, and this is all going to be a threat based approach so you need to develop the threat from phase one onwards and uh, make sure that you monitor it and update the assessment as needed um, throughout the whole process. So that's it. Um, that's basically um, a very quick run through. Um, I mentioned numerous sort of measures and things like that. When, after our coffee break, uh, we're going to look at nuclear material, nuclear facility protection in a bit more depth. And so I will go into uh, many of these measures and uh, in a little more detail. But uh, at this stage, um, 
I hope we've got across there are a lot of things that a government has to do in order that the operators who are going to construct um, and manage this nuclear power plant are quite clear as exactly what they've got to do. Um, which means the government has got to work out pretty much before exactly what they're quite clear of. Um, because nothing is more di disruptive than you're constructing a major facility like this and suddenly find out the government's turned around and suddenly thought of some new thing that it wants. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you have to try and work out how to change the design or whatever to accommodate it. Every, everything needs to be well thought out uh, beforehand. So, um, yeah, we've got some, have some more questions now. And I have one from the front here. Yeah. Ready? Yes. Uh, how we can uh, apply the principles, uh, the three principles of pure field, uh, the, the prevention, detection, and response to the inside the Um. Yeah, prevention. That was really when I was talking there about prevention, detection, response. It was really about. Um, material out of regulatory control. In other words, stuff that's um, uh, out there, it's already been lost or for one reason or another or stolen. Um, as regards prevention, detection, response at a facility, I'm going to cover that after the break because uh, we're going to look at how to protect a, a facility and, and, and we'll talk a bit about um, how, um, what measures we put in place to prevent attacks and and then detect and respond to them if they do take place, whether they're insiders or not. So we'll, we'll cover that if we can after the coffee break. Um, one, of the, one at the back here, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of IAEA documents related to the safety process, like interactions between the operators and the facility. Uh, what do you think is the first time Yeah, yeah. So it's a question about uh, the interface between safety culture and security culture. Um, <clears throat> they're not the t same thing, uh, but they're very similar. Um, uh, why I say they're not exactly the same is because one of the key security measures is to maintain confidentiality on sensitive information. Whereas in the safety area, if anything goes wrong, it spread the word and tell everyone um, exactly what the problem is so that people make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, if we've got a weakness or something in, in the security area, until we fixed it, we do not want to go and advertise that fact. So we have these conflicting things really where in safety, you're encouraging everyone to own up and point out problems, whereas in security, we need this done, but in a much more you know, confidential uh, way. Um, that, that's one of, the, one of the sort of key sort of differences between the two. Um, is there a book on it? Yes. Uh, this, again, is an interesting area. In safety, you won't find a single book on, separate book on safety culture. It's all part of safety management. Um, in security, yes, there is an implementing guide on nuclear security culture, um, which actually says that the answer to this lies in good management. <laughs> so we've sort of reversed it, if you like, um, and I'll explain after the coffee break why the reason of that is. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it, it's basically similar in terms of you want good leadership at the top. If the top doesn't believe in safety or security, you won't see it properly done anywhere throughout the whole facility or organization. Um, a key of it is good management, uh, making sure that um, there's good flow of information from, from the workers up to the managers and back and, and that sort of thing. Um, but the key thing really with nuclear security, security culture is getting across 
um, two things. One, there is a threat out there. It may not happen tomorrow, but it could happen the day after. And secondly, that all these measures we require you to take, wearing bits of you know, passes, are important. Um, and um, you need to rigorously do follow the procedures laid down. So that is the basis of, of nuclear sec security culture, uh, those two things. Um, so it's awareness training, making sure that people are aware that there are threats out there and they could be directed at your facility um, and um, making sure they understand the role they play because everybody in a facility has some role for security, exactly the same way as they have for safety. Uh, everybody has a responsibility, a personal responsibility to follow procedures or whatever. Um, and obviously managers have more responsibilities. Any, uh, yes, another question yeah, over here. Yeah. Yes. Just like in safety, we consider design basis accidents. Yeah. And non, sorry, beyond design basis. Yeah. So, in respect of uh, security or threat assessment and security, you mentioned national threat assessment, design basis threat. Mm. So, I want to ask: Is there any consideration for beyond design threats? Uh, beyond design basis threat. Right? Yeah, this is an interesting area. Um, it, it, the whole issue about design basis threat is being re-looked at. Um, I think it's a good argument saying design basis threat is the threats that the operator has to protect against um, in his designing his facility and establishing various measures to protect it. Um, whereas beyond design basis threat would be what the state has to handle. And that would include things like um, standoff attacks. In other words, launching an attack against a nuclear facility from outside it on land that the operator does not control, um, that clearly becomes a state responsibility. Um, I'm sure you can get the police to go and visit you know, potential uh, spots every now and again and uh, question anyone they see hanging around in those sort of areas but the operator can't do that so if you like you could call that beyond design basis in terms of what the operator has to design against the state still has to uh, protect against it and the operator may have to take measures to mitigate it uh, rocket attack or something like that although the operator cannot normally um, doesn't have the powers to prevent someone firing a rocket at a facility. Uh, nevertheless, the operator could actually put up uh, means to mitigate the effects, explosive effects of it. Uh, for instance, putting you know, metal screens up in front of um, key targets and things so that you, the, the missile explodes before it hits the target, that sort of thing. So there can be a bit of a a mix here. It all very much depends on you know what your threats are, um, and uh, deciding for the government to decide who's going to handle what. What, what. This is the whole thing. Who's you know what's what's the capability we're protecting against, and who's going to be responsible for ensuring that there is protection against that. Yeah. Yeah, the question is how do we um, assess trustworthiness? <laughs> well, the thing about trustworthiness, your assessment is only as good as the day it is done. Uh, and so all managers have to remember that. They, I, a number of times I've heard managers say, oh, well, he's trustworthy. And I'm going, well, he was trustworthy last year on such and such a date when the state authority carried out a police a criminal records check and a security service check against him and we couldn't find anything you know <laughs> it, what i'm really saying is um it's an ongoing process you you can do various things i mean a lot of a lot of it it's good hr uh, recruitment things you know is he who he says he is 
Does he have the qualifications that he claims to have? All these sort of things. It's amazing how many people were recruited on, on you know, who, who just come up with a good story on the day and say, you know, I'm really expert at this, this, and this. Oh, good, we'll recruit you. Not good HR recruitment at all. I mean, you need to check out all these things. So HR's got a big role to play here. Um, the state can obviously check its records to see what's known against the individual. Once you have confirmed who the individual is, so you need him to produce a passport or other identity card or something and, and actually, you know, because it's not much good us at the state doing a check against someone who's got a false name. <laughs> We're not going to get anything. <laughs> so yeah, there are those sort of things. But, but really, it's ongoing monitoring. Um, uh, certain certain things can be done beforehand, but thereafter it, it's uh, a good sort of relationship between managers and their, their, their staff. Uh, and again, security culture, people should, if they've got concerns about an individual, be um, passing them up to, to management uh, in order to... Um, to you know, it's, it's someone, you know, I mean... We're not only talking about criminals. I mean, we're also talking about people with mental problems here. Um, the number of cases I know where where individuals, employees have you know stolen material to um, for weird reasons of their own because they've gone a bit you know funny in the head. Um, so it's it's a quite a complex area, um, and but it's all governed. It, it very. I can't give you. a this is how to do it because like most things in security it depends very much on government structures it depends on national culture uh, in some countries things you know we do things in another country we we can't do that you know um, uh, so it, it, it's very much for each state to come up with its own way of determining trustworthiness but it's absolutely key to dealing with what we call the insider threat. Anyway, it's um, now coffee break time, so um, uh, we'll have more time to um, have some questions after the next session, I'm sure. So thank you for all the very interesting questions I've had so far.